Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we cover uh, Plastic Free Eco Challenge and other zero waste actions with the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. Um, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium is well known and loved for their action around conservation and public education. They are doing some truly amazing work at recycling and leading us towards a more sustainable future by inviting all of us to take action and be a part of the Plastic Free Eco Challenge. Many of you are probably already familiar with the Plastic Free July, which is a global movement to help millions of people around the world reduce the amount of plastic they consume and be a part of the solution to plastic pollution. I know that we have 10 days left um, in the month of July to participate, but keep in mind, it is never too late to uh, go green and help and help have more sustainable practices for the future. Remember, it's really not about doing things perfectly, but rather considering all of your options and knowing how your actions can make a difference for the animals and the plants that we share this beautiful planet with. Real quick, a couple of housekeeping tips that I wanna uh, remind you of to help enhance your experience tonight during the webinar. Uh, GoToWebinar has a couple features. One of them is uh, the sometimes the screen will disappear on you. It has the potential to, and I don't want you to get nervous. What I, what I want you to look for is the blue snowflake in at the bottom of your toolbar. If you see the blue snowflake, click on that. That will bring your screen back to the front. There's also a control panel that has a variety of options within the panel. You're gonna see an orange arrow at the top of the control panel. If you click on this control panel, it will expand it and it'll show you a couple features. The two features that are helpful this evening, the questions and chat box. So as a reminder, everyone is on mute throughout the duration of tonight's session. But I encourage everyone to ask questions as we move along through the presentation. So please type in your questions at any point um, in the questions and chat box, and I will be covering all of those at the end of tonight's presentation. We also have a handout tonight. If you're interested in downloading the handout, it's the slides from tonight's presentation if you would like to share them with someone else. Double click on the handout and it'll download to your desktop. If you're having trouble, trouble downloading the handouts, no worries. Please email me after tonight's webinar and I'll be happy to share them with you. So I'd like to introduce you to our presenters tonight from the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. Tonight we have Dr. Michael Heger, the Vice President of Conservation and Sustainability as well as Allison Edwards, the conservation specialist from the zoo and the aquarium. And then my name is Amy Densborn. I am Swaco's education specialist. So real quickly, I did wanna briefly provide you with an overview of what we do at Swaco and who we are as an organization. So we manage the waste stream for Central Ohio, and we work to divert materials from the local landfill through offering diversion services and programming around recycling household materials, household hazardous waste. We offer grants to nonprofits, communities, and other school districts to help them reduce the amount of waste they generate. We offer public recycling drop-off locations all around Franklin County to those who maybe don't have access to recycling. And then we also provide educational talks and landfill tours. That is just a quick snapshot of some of the programs that Swaco offers to Franklin County, the Franklin County community. If you are interested in learning more, I encourage you to check out Swaco.org. So even though 
more waste is going to our local landfill every year, our rates of diversion continue to climb. What that means is we are recycling and composting more every year as a community. We have a diversion rate right now of 50%. That's really impressive considering that the national average is right around 34%. However, we do still send about 1 million tons of materials to the landfill every year. Does that number surprise anybody? So our first trivia question for the evening, uh, what percentage of landfilled materials had the potential to be reused, recycled, or composted? I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. And if I could get everyone to participate, select the answer that you think is accurate. Is it 50%? 62% or 76%? Give it your best guess. We've got about 50% of the votes then. I'm gonna give it a, about 10 more seconds and I'll go ahead and close the poll. 75% in. Eighty-five percent in. We're getting really close. I want to make sure everyone has a chance to vote. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it out. So uh, about half of everyone tonight said sixty-two percent, and then a smaller group said um, fifty percent. So actually, the number. Uh, the percentage of material that could have been diverted through reuse, recycling, or composting is 76%. So you guys were pretty close. And what is this equal to in terms of a dollar value? This means that if we were able to extract this additional material from the landfill, from before it actually got to the landfill, and get it into current recycling and composting markets, we would bring an additional $23 million to our community. The reason why we know this is because Swaco recently conducted a waste audit. This tells us the types of materials that are being landfilled in our community. And we found out that we're throwing a lot of materials in the, in the trash can that truly, truly don't belong there. They had the potential to be composted, recycled or reused in some other manner. The top two types of materials that are landfilled in our community's landfill in Franklin County are food waste, uh, num the number one type material by weight at 15% of the total waste stream. That's roughly 1 million pounds of materials that we receive daily at the Franklin County Sanitary Landfill. And the number two, number two type material that we receive is cardboard. So if you think about the prevalence of e-commerce and online shopping, many of those products being shipped in cardboard boxes. Food scraps can be recovered um, if, they're, if they're salvageable, get them into the hands of hungry members of our community. Um, and if they're not, if it's food scraps like the tops of onions and avocado pits, they can be composted. Cardboard boxes are also 100% recyclable in Franklin County's curbside and Swaco drop-off recycling programs. So how can you contribute? As parents, friends, neighbors, and colleagues, you are in an important position to help make a measurable difference and lead us towards a more sustainable future. Waco has set a goal of helping Franklin County reach a 75% diversion rate by 2032. We cannot do this alone. We need everybody's help. How can you get involved? Well, starting with knowing what's accepted for recycling and practicing this at home and work will help us get there. So everything that you see on the left hand side is accepted for single stream or mixed recycling. So you can see that includes paper and cardboard, plastic bottles, jugs, 
in tubs, that's the newest expansion to the list starting in January of this year, glass bottles and jars, all metal cans, carton containers, and when we recycle, we must keep all of our items loose. This ensures that the recyclables can reach their full potential as a new product. Few, few clarifications that I do want to make. You do not need to remove any labels. Please keep the lids on the containers, okay? So lids should be on the, the bottles, jugs, and tubs if it's a rigid, hard lid. Lids can stay on glass bottles and jars if it's a metal lid. Same thing with the metal cans. And then carton containers should be lid free, okay? And then if you have labels or tape or tape or anything on your paper and cardboard, that's okay to stay on there too. You don't have to worry about removing all of that. However, our materials should be as clean as possible. Make sure they are free of food debris and other contaminants. So give them a quick rinse, put them in the recycling bin when you're done. A couple clarifications on what's not accepted. So everything on the right-hand side of the slide are some of the common materials that we see in the recycling stream that truly don't belong there. So clamshell containers, something that might hold your strawberries or your blueberries or salad, as well as styrofoam or polystyrene is not accepted. Tanglers, such as cords and hangers, are not accepted in the program. Plastic bags. Uh, plastic bags are 100% recyclable. Please take them back to the retail store where you bought them from. Places like Kroger, Target, Walmart, Meyer, and Kohl's all have bring me back boxes that you can take the bags and put them in and they can, will be recycled and made into new plastic bags. And then at this time, cups are not accepted in the program. That includes any cup, Starbucks, party cups, um, as well as coffee cups. So what happens when we place these items in the recycling bin, um, all the not accepted materials? They end up taking a long detour to a landfill. So many of you might be sitting here thinking, well, I use a lot of plastic that has the recycling symbol on it. Doesn't that belong in the recycling bin? Well, that recycling number that you see with the chasing arrows and the number, that is actually just a, res a plastic resin identification code. So it is to tell you the type of plastic resin you are holding. It's really for the plastic manufacturing company, and it's not designed for us as the consumer. So just because it has that number at the bottom doesn't necessarily mean it's accepted in your curbside recycling program. The most common uh, plastic resins that we see and we, and we use in the store are gonna be your ones and your twos. So those are gonna be your bottles and your jugs. Um, your number fives are gonna be things like your plastic tubs. Um, and then it's polystyrene is a six. That's gonna be things like styrofoam, which would come in like an electronics um, box for packaging. So while we're on the topic of plastics, I thought we would have another trivia question um, to get us thinking about um, how we use plastic and interact with it, um, and then to, to segue into um, what the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium has to tell us about how we can reduce the amount of plastic um, that we consume on a daily basis. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Uh, the question is, um, what is plastic's largest, largest market right now? Is it textiles? Is it construction? Is it transportation? Or is it packaging? Give it your best guess. I've got about 65% of the votes in. I'm going to give it about another five seconds or so. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out. Thank you to those who voted. 
the majority of everyone did say packaging. So about 80% of people uh, did say that packaging is the number one market for for plastic, and you are absolutely correct. The packaging industry makes up about 36% of the plastic production. So good job, everybody. You know your plastics. So while we know recycling is a part of the solution, it's not going to solve the plastic crisis. We simply can't continue to recycle our way out of plastic pollution. Growing awareness of the plastic crisis has quickly led to consumer demand for alternatives such as reusable grocery bags, refusing single-use straws and utensils, and buying food in bulk um, with minimal to zero packaging. The biggest way we can have an impact is to use less stuff and to thereby create less waste. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my friends at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium to tell us more about the Plastic Free Eco Challenge and other zero waste actions that have a big impact on the planet and keep our waterways healthy. Let me go ahead and turn your mic back on. There we go, Michael, thank you. Okay, thank you, Amy. This is Mike Krager. I'm the Vice President of Conservation and Sustainability at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and the Wilds. And actually, I have the part of the presentation that's a little bit of a downer. Um, there's a few graphic images that you'll see here, but I do wanna start out by saying that even last year dur during the pandemic, um, the zoo recycled over 100 tons of material. And in fact, we composted over 1,300 tons of material. We're really working hard to be as sustainable and, and green as we can. And we invite our visitors and the community to join us and join Swaco in doing this. There are about 350 metric tons of plastics produced worldwide each year. And of that, about half of it is single-use plastics. And that's really where we're going to focus tonight. And of all the plastics produced, 91% of it is not recycled. It winds up in the landfill or it winds up in our waterways, our oceans, our rivers, and so forth. And so currently the estimate is 1.7 billion tons of plastic per year winds up in the marine environment. Now we know that over 700 marine species are killed or were injured by plastics. And the ways that that happens is typically through the animals feeding on the plastics, they're ingesting it or they're absorbing it, especially if you're something like a, a mussel or a clam, or they get entangled. Um, in fact, they say that by 2050, it's estimated that the, bio, the weight of all the plastics in the ocean will be heavier than the weight of all the fish in the ocean. If we could have the next slide, please. So um, these pictures come from a partner. We, do, we, we have about 75 conservation projects going on worldwide right now. And we heard from one of our partners in Sri Lanka who has a turtle project, a sea turtle project. And it's a very important project, but very recently there was a ship um, called the Express Pearl. Maybe you heard about it in the news. The Express Pearl exploded off the coast of Sri Lanka and spilled lots and lots of chemicals. And it, it also included 26 metric tons of plastic pellets. And these pellets are used to make other plastic um, materials. People call these pellets nurdles. Now, I don't want to totally disparage plastic because we, we have used plastic since the 1940s to keep food fresh and it has certain properties that are very valuable to us and certainly um, for the uh, medical industry and getting us through the pandemic, 
some of these single pl use plastics have been very, very important. What our point is tonight is where we can reduce them, where we can recycle them, we should. So if you look at this picture, uh, the image on the left is a fish that is was swimming in the, those waters off the coast of Sri Lanka, and those are those plastic pellets or nurdles that were inside the fish. And you can imagine if you're a fisherman there, it's an environmental and an economic cost. And if you look at the picture on the right, those people in the white suits are officials from the Sri Lankan government, and they are shoveling what looks like snow on the beach, and those are those plastic pellets. So, um, you know, the a animals are certainly ingesting these plastics. Um, some, maybe some of you go uh, diving and you might see sea turtles who look at those floating plastic bags as if they're jellyfish, which turtles like to eat. And what happens is they'll eat those plastic bags and they get caught in the esophagus, they cause blockages, and animals actually starve to death that way. Um, if you're a bivalve or a crustacean like a shrimp, these plastics bioaccumulate in their systems and they their plastics don't um, break down very well. And so these chemicals are absorbed by their bodies and then it goes up the food chain by whatever eats them, including people. And then we have those chemicals produced by those plastics in our system. Um, and the second major effect on wildlife is entanglement. And here you see a couple of pictures of manatees. The one on the left is a manatee in Belize. It's swimming through a river. It could just as easily be Florida. That's got um, pieces of plastic floating on the top. And manatees typically, you know, they'll they'll feed on sea grasses, but they also feed on water hyacinths near the surface. Not only um, are they eating in places where there's a lot of plastics, but they get entangled with it. And you can see there's a, a manatee um, on the right whose flipper is um, is caught in discarded fishing filament. So the message here is is very important because we are losing a lot of animals that are getting caught in discarded fishing line or fishing nets. They call them ghost nets that have just been cut off from from fishing trawlers and left out at sea. So the message the message is there's something that you can do as an individual, and that is if you fish, don't leave your monofilament lines in the water. Just dispose of it properly. And if we could go to the next slide, um, you've probably seen pictures like this before. Uh, there, there's a stork there that's got a plastic bag over its head. Um, there's a, a gull that's full of plastics in its gut. You know, they, they pick up these plastics as uh, they're attracted to the color, they swallow it. It helps them as if they were eating a small pebble to grind material in their, uh, their gizzard, but it also blocks them up. And uh, on the right, you can see a gull with its head stuck in one of those six pack uh, rings. And so it's very important that if you get soft drinks or bottled water or anything that might have that set of six pack rings, that you cut it up before you discard it so that nothing can get stuck in there. Um, and then the last thing I, I just want to touch on is um, you see you see the picture on the left, that is a raft of plastic um, called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And there are a number of these in our oceans now where currents take the plastics that are in the water and circulate them around so that they get concentrated. And when you have something like this, for one thing, it's a way that invasive species can move from one country to the next, one coast to the next. And the other, um, and of course you have entanglement and ingesting as well. And then if you look to the right there, um, you know, there are health effects of simply producing these plastics. Um, 
we know that methane is produced, which is a greenhouse gas from the production of plastics. And we know that, um, that plastics also um, are created by, um, by using petroleum. And so we have, to, um, we have to regulate the kind of contaminants that come out of, out of industry that produce these things. And a lot of, a lot of these uh, petrochemicals that come from plastics um, are in uh, marginalized communities. So that's something else we need to be aware of. So there are lots of health effects. There are health effects on wildlife. We're seeing reproductive effects, um, such as uh, decreased fertility in some species that are um, affected by the chemicals that leach out of these plastics. So, um, what, you know, the, the World Wildlife Fund did a study where they announced that the average person could ingest about five grams of plastic per week. Five grams of plastic per week is like a credit card. So um, we want to avoid that as much as possible. So I, I mentioned a couple of things you can do. You know, you, you want to discard the, the filaments. You want to cut up the, um, the, the rings that hold our drinks. Um, another thing you can do is advocate for legislation that helps reduce the harmful effects of plastics. And right now in Congress, there is a bill, both in the House and the Senate, called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And there are a lot of co-sponsors. If you're interested in that, it's Senate Bill 984 and House Bill 200, or 2000, well, House Bill 2238, okay? Um, other things we can do, and probably the most important things we can do are recycle our plastics or or stop using plastics, particularly single-use plastics, and, and find alternatives. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison, who has some good news for you about the Plastic Free Eco Challenge. Hi guys, my name is Allison Edwards. I am the Conservation Specialist here at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, and tonight I'm excited to be able to tell you about the Plastic Free Eco Challenge and the Gorillas Online Initiative that we participate in here at the Columbus Zoo. So, as I mentioned, here at the Columbus Zoo, we're very aware of the impacts that plastics have on wildlife, and we want to do our part to reduce the likelihood that they end up in the environment by working to use less plastic in our daily lives. This is one action we can take to help wildlife and ourselves. One way we can start by taking this journey is through participating in the Plastic Free Eco Challenge. This challenge is an initiative that happens every year, and it's free to participate in. The challenge encourages participants to think about all the plastic we use each day and to consider what alternatives we could use instead so that we can create less waste and work to um, change our long-term habits. The, the Plastic Free Eco Challenge encourages participants to join a team where we will sign up to select actions and to work with each other so that we can all be successful. Through this month, when you check in, you get points and the team that wins gets bragging rights, which is a big deal. The platform works like Facebook, and it encourages our participants to work with teammates, to share successes, and to work through obstacles. This um, challenge may seem intimidating, but if you just choose a few simple actions in the beginning, we find that this makes the challenge more manageable. Next slide, please. So sometimes I feel like it's overwhelming that we have so much plastic in our lives. But as Amy mentioned, only certain plastics are recyclable, so that's a problem. And as Dr. Krager mentioned, these plastics have imp impacts on wildlife and on humans too. The Plastic Free Platform has many actions that are encouraged to lessen our single-use plastic dependency. I'd like to tell you about a couple that we can choose that um, will help us start this journey. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, they're broken up into categories, and the first category is the food category. 
One simple action that I chose was to skip the straw. Do you really need a straw? Some plastic straws simply go into the landfill or end up in our waterways, and this is detrimental to wildlife. As an alternative, you could choose to use a silicone straw or a metal straw, if you even need one. Secondly, it's advantageous to choose to use a reusable water bottle. This will save you money in the long term, although it may seem expensive in the beginning. Um, these plastics just are totally unnecessary in our lives. Lastly, you can choose to reuse to-go containers that you get from restaurants. This is an easy way to reduce your plastic use and to save a little money when you go out to eat. From the personal care category, there's a lot of simple changes that you can swap out, such as choosing to buy a bamboo toothbrush instead of a plastic one. Do we really need a plastic toothbrush? I don't think so. Additionally, you can choose to use a steel razor instead of a plastic handled one, whereas the plastic ones may be lighter, the steel ones may last you longer. Lastly, you can choose to buy beauty products that come in glass containers as opposed to a plastic container. You can reuse these cute small tubs again for a variety of uses. I think we skipped a slide, Amy. There we are, we're back. Okay, so from the community and lifestyle categories, a simple action you can choose is to pick up litter. It doesn't need to be in the environment anyhow, and this is a good way to show others that you're committed to the environment and cleaning up after yourselves. A second thing that you can do is to join a cleanup effort because more hands make light work. So if you're ever interested, the zoo hosts many cleanup events each year, or you could even host your own. It's pretty cool. Lastly, you can share what you're learning on social media to, great, to um, promote all of these actions that you're taking. It's free and you might get others in your community interested in why you're doing what you're doing. From the lifestyle category, you could choose to use reusable utensils, bottles, and containers when you travel. It may seem difficult at first, but when you start this new habit, it will make a difference in what you use and the waste that you create. Another easy um, action that you can take from this category is to watch a documentary. If you're already watching Netflix, why not watch something that will help you learn? Third action I would encourage from this category is that you can buy clothes made of natural fibers. When you wash a item made with a synthetic fiber, those plastics that make up the strings eventually biodegrade into the waterway and this can lead to um, rivers and streams and even the ocean. This impacts wildlife there. Next slide, please. So lastly, in the family care, and pet category, there's a few things that you can choose to do. Instead of using dog poop bags, you can choose to use ones that are made of biodegradable materials. There are many alternatives to plastic that are now out on the market, such as cornstarch. And you can always use a grocery bag that you would have otherwise thrown away, again, to lessen your waste. Secondly, there's many recipes out on the internet where you can make your own pet treats. Try out what you want to and see what your pets like. This is important because it is easy and it's cheaper usually. In the family category, you can choose to use cloth diapers as opposed to the one-use disposable ones. Seems like an effort. I've never done it myself, but I would love to hear what people think about this option. Secondly, you can teach your children to not use glitter. It's sparkly and fun, but it's just in the end messy. It's made of plastic and that's detrimental to wildlife. Lastly, you can spend time learning together, which encourages your children to become good stewards of our planet and to use less plastic. Next slide, please. So I'd like to speak to you a little bit about the impacts that this challenge has had over its four year history. In 2018, 5,242 participants from 80 teams in five countries completed almost 150,000 actions. That's a big deal. The next year, participation increased where 15,225 participants took actions from 772 teams in 52 countries. This led to almost 190,000 actions being completed. It's a big deal. Next, please. Then 2020 hit and the challenge was a little different. Only 5,132 participants participated from 381 teams from 46 countries. We 
leading to um, 80,000 actions being taken. And then this year, we're mostly through the challenge, but we're proud to report that 6,394 participants are participating from 360, 386 teams in 52 countries. And so far we've completed just over 80,000 actions. We're really proud of these results and are thankful for those who have chosen to participate. Next slide, please. So to give you a couple more metrics, I'd like to tell you that participants in the four years of the challenge history have chosen not to use over 115,000 straws. Additionally, because participants have chosen not to use to-go containers, 143,000 containers have not gone to the landfill. Next, when people choose not to use single-use water bottles, we keep over 129,500 water bottles out of landfills. And because our participants are super cool, we've picked up over 220,000 pieces of litter over the course of four Julys since this challenge has begun. Next slide, please. So something else that we're super excited to participate in each year is an initiative called Gorillas on the Line. It's an e-recycling campaign hosted by the AZA, which is the American, no, Association of Zoos and Aquariums um, group called the Gorilla Species Survival Plan. And it's a group that works to promote gorilla conservation. Here at the zoo, we keep a receptacle where electronics that are donated can be sent off to be recycled. This is a big deal because most devices contain a mineral called coltan. Coltan is mined under gorilla habitat, and that's a detriment to gorilla survival. So as a reminder, it'd be really awesome to bring your old devices that you're no longer using to the Columbus Zoo so that we can recycle them in an earth-friendly way. When we send off these devices, we receive money that goes towards gorilla conservation. And this is an awesome way to keep devices out of landfills and recycled in a proper way that protects gorilla habitat. Next slide, please. So in summary, we've talked about a lot of things that the Columbus Zoo does that promotes environmental stewardship and initiatives that we're proud to participate in. So as we mentioned, single-use plastics have a negative impact on human and wildlife health in addition to our planet's well-being. It's not too late to join our Plastic Free Eco Challenge team if you're interested this year, or just take a peek at the website to see how you can participate next year. It's free to participate, so please pass the word along to friends and family. We'd love to have you on our team. Lastly, you can contribute to gorilla conservation by bringing your old devices to Gorillas on the Line here at the Columbus Zoo. For any more information, please feel free to reach out to the Columbus Zoo through contacting Dr. Kreger or I at the list of emails. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Allison and Dr. Dr. Krieger. We appreciate that information that you shared. It was all very informative, and I learned a few new things, and I'm sure many of our um, audience members tonight learned a lot. So thank you for that. Um, I had a couple questions that have been coming in. Um, one was really a comment, um, and it, it was regarding um, Allison's uh, thought on not trying the the um, cloth diapers yet, but I have a couple people on the call that said, um, one said that it's, she's looking to try it later this year. And another one has actually shared her experience using cloth diapers, saying that um, it, it, it is more work, but it's doable. But the trick is to make sure you have lots of diapers on hand. So don't, don't skimp on purchasing those reusable cloth diapers. Make sure you have plenty because when you're in a pinch, you need an extra one. You don't want to clean the old ones. So that's the tip that we're sharing with the audience tonight. All right, so let's start with the questions this evening. So um, we had a question that came in about what plastics the city of Columbus accepts. And I want to make note here that the re recycling program is all for all of Franklin County. So if you live in the city of Columbus versus Worthington, Westerville, Hilliard, wherever you are within Franklin County, if you have access to curbside recycling or you take your recyclables to a Swaco drop-off facility, 
everything that you can recycle is the same, all right? So my friends on the call tonight who live in the city of Columbus, everything that we talked about tonight applies to you. So that means that for when it comes to the plastics, you can recycle plastic bottles, jugs, and tubs, all right? So the tubs is a new part of the program. That's our newest expansion. Our partners at Rumpke Waste and Recycling, they are the central Ohio recycling processor for, for our region. And they recently found a new buyer for this these plastic tubs, which now means that they can collect them, sort them, and then ensure that there is a stable buyer or stable market for that material type. So these are going to be tubs such as cottage cheese, butter, yogurt, um, fruit cups, pudding cups, um, anything that would be in a tub container that you might get from the deli. Those are all classified as tubs, okay? So that's that's the plastic category. I, did, I received a question about receipts and are receipts recyclable? Unfortunately, receipts are not recyclable. The reason being, they it's actually um, a type of thermal paper. It has a chemical on it called BPA, which is an endocrine disruptor, and it should not be placed in our recycling stream because it's really hard to remove that BPA, and it can end up getting um, stuck in other materials once they're recycled, okay? So please do not place your receipts in the recycling bin. The safest, most environmentally friendly solution is to place them in the trash because a landfill is a contained environment. I had another question about zero waste boxes. So for those of you who are interested in TerraCycles program, they provide a variety of zero waste boxes, anything from batteries to PPE to gum. That's right, they have a box for gum. So if you're looking to pay for the service, um, you can purchase a, a box, They'll it, it'll ship to your address and it'll have a prepaid label on it. You should, once the, the box is full of material that you're looking to recycle, send it back to the facility and they will recycle it on your behalf. It's a really cool program. Um, and it's if you go to terracycle.com, you can learn more about their zero waste boxes. So um, it, what works really well is in office spaces for um, like snack bags and snack wrappers. If you are if you work in an office space and there's a vending machine, consider getting one of those boxes to divert and recycle all of your snack bags. All right, I'm just going through here. Um, someone asked a question, Allison, about the the Gorilla program for recycling electronics. Do um, can any electronic qualify for this program? Is it only specific types, and is the information available on the website? Sure. Yeah. So I'd like to speak a little bit more about that. The Gorillas on the Line initiative accepts handheld devices. That's anything up to as big as a laptop computer. Unfortunately, we can't take your refrigerator. That would be silly to ship that out of our state. So we can take things like cell phones, cell phone accessories, iPads and e-readers, iWatch, Apple Watches and Fitbits. We can accept computers and tablets. I can accept things like GPS devices and external hard drives. And if anybody has more questions, please shoot me an email because Beyond that list of things that I can accept, I'm always willing to reach out to our recycling company to see if they'll accept other things. Great, thank you, Allison, for that clarification. Um, there was a question that came in this evening about recycling shredded paper. This is a common question. Um, I encourage everyone to check out Swaco's website. It's called recycleright.org, and it is a awareness campaign really tasked with educating the public on the proper methods of recycling and how recycling supports our local economy and protects our environment all right and so they're on that website recyclerights.org there is a search tool 
and there's over 300 different locations in our community in Franklin County to safely donate, compost, recycle, or dispose of a wide array of materials. So this would include shredded paper, my friends. Now, I'm a composter at home, and I'm also a shredder at home. I actually take my shredded paper and I add it to my compost bin. It's a great source of carbon. You don't really need to worry about the environmental concerns with inks anymore because they're mostly soy based. So if it's not heavily colored paper, it cannot, it can go in your recycling bin. If you're not, excuse me, compost bin. If you're not a composter, you can recycle this paper. The, if you remember earlier tonight, we talked about how plastic bags do not belong in the recycling bin. This is the one caveat to that rule. The only time Rumpke wants plastic bags is if it is in a shredded paper is inside of it. So that is to help keep the shredded paper contained so it doesn't cross contaminate all of the other materials. The clear bag is important because there are people working at the recycling facility that will remove the bag off of the recycling line on the conveyor belt and walk the bag over to the paper line, dump the contents out to ensure that that paper reaches its full potential and is recycled in the paper stream. All right. So in a clear plastic bag. Please don't place shredded paper loose in your recycling bin. It'll just end up contaminating everything else in the recycling stream. You can also take your shredded paper to places like Staples. Um, they will shred it for you, and then you don't even have to worry about it. So I encourage anyone, if you have other material types that you're looking to recycle or divert, please talk, check out our search tool at recycleright.org. I had a question this evening about a composting program. So I know we didn't talk really at all about composting tonight. That's not um, the point of tonight's uh, conversation, but I did briefly want to mention um, that there are a variety of composting programs in Franklin County. Um, seven different communities um, have a local food waste drop-off program. Please check out Swaco.org to learn more about those seven participating communities. I don't have them all memorized off the top of my head. Um, and if you don't live in one of those participating communities, please check, check into a subscription service. We're really lucky to have three different compost providers here in Central Ohio that will either pick up your food scraps from your house or you can take your bucket to a farmer's market and exchange it for a clean um, empty bucket. And so um, the three subscription services that I would encourage you to look into Beverly, we have Compost Exchange, Go Zero, and kids that compost. Again, this information can be found on swaco.org. If you navigate to the food waste page, you can always email me afterwards and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, someone asked a question about recycling batteries. Um, should batteries go in the recycling bin? Allison and Dr. Krieger, should the batteries go in the recycling bin? Okay. No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> they, they are not on our acceptable material list. So please do not place any sort of battery or electronic in your recycling bin. There are options for you though. You can take your batteries to Swaco's Permanent House, Household Hazardous Waste Facility. The information about that can be found on swaco.org. It's a free program for Franklin County residents. Businesses are not included. Uh, we take all sorts of hazardous waste. So this is gonna be include uh, things like paint, pool chemicals, pesticides, um, oils, fats, greases, light bulbs, batteries, uh, electronics, anything that would be classified as hazardous or flammable. Please take it to our drop off location. We will make sure it gets disposed of safely.
All right. I think I've gotten to everybody's questions here. There was another comment about uh, recycling programs varying largely across um, United States and even varying between bordering communities. That is absolutely correct and an excellent observation. I know myself, I've lived in many different states and it is different everywhere you go. And so the reason why that is, is because each material recovery facility has to find a stable buyer or end user for these different materials. It's really kind of developed on a business model. If there isn't a stable buyer for those material types, that MRF is not going to recycle the material. We are so lucky to have Rumkey Waste and Recycling as our central Ohio recycling processor. They have developed stable markets domestically, and most of them are actually right here in the Midwest. We have been relatively insulated from these issues with Asia not accepting uh, plastic materials anymore. Um, they, that was, that's called the National Sword, and that, that started, in, I believe, in 2018, if my memory serves me right. And so because Rumkey developed local, has developed par partnerships and uh, relationships with local buyers for these materials, um, we are still able to recycle everything, and even now more, plastic tubs. And so 95% of everything that Rumkey collects stays here in the domestic United States, and 80% of that stays right here in Ohio. So when you recycle, you are supporting jobs in the local economy, and you're also just making our Midwest Ohio community a more resilient economy, okay? So everything that you're doing to reduce, reuse, and recycle does have an impact, and we really want you to keep up the great work. So I want to thank everyone tonight for your attention and for spending the last hour with us this evening going through talking about ways that we can make an impact and really truly make a difference for the betterment of our planet and these beautiful animals that thrive in our um, in our world. I really love those manatees. Those are some of my favorites. So I want to thank Allison and Dr. Krieger for joining us tonight and then sharing some of their wisdom with us. Um, it was really wonderful to hear everything they had to say. As a friendly reminder to those, um, there will be a short survey at the end of this session. It's about seven questions. We really do appreciate hearing your insights and your thoughts for improvements. If you have topics of other webinars that you'd like to, um, you'd like Swaco to cover, we want to hear your ideas. Please follow us on social media. Follow the zoo on social media too. They post some really cool stuff with the, the animals there. So I wanna thank everyone again one last time and I hope everyone has a great evening. Take care folks. Thank you.